بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أفضل الصلاة وسك التسليم على مبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the criminal law of Islam This is a new subject that we are starting this semester inshallah However, this subject is connected to another subject which is the fiqh because criminal law is part of the general law part of the sharia why it is separated why it is taught separately because criminal law in particular was criticized now the enemies of islam they tried to criticize everything they could find in islam but they were unable to stop muslims from practicing so no matter how much they criticize our prayer they criticize our fasting they criticize this, they criticize that. Muslims won't stop fasting or praying or performing hajj. But when it comes to the criminal law, they criticized it and they were successful in stopping Muslims from implementing the criminal law. Now, it is almost not applied anywhere in the world. The criminal law of the Sharia. So it is important to study it to know why the enemies focused on that part and why Muslims are not implementing the Islamic criminal law. Is it true, as they claim, that it is outdated? It is true what they claim that it is invalid anymore? So, if it's not true, then why it is not implemented? That's the question. So, we will start with the introduction. Now, when we say the Islamic law, who laid the foundation of the Islamic law? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a divine law compared to the man-made law. So you have to remember one thing. When was this law established, the Islamic law? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed Muslims to cut off the hand of the thief, to kill the killer, and so on and so forth. More than 1400 years ago. However, when we compare that law, we are comparing it to our current law. Forget about the laws that were at that time in Persia, in Rome, in other countries, because they are way outdated. We're not, we're not talking about those laws. We're talking about the current law. We're comparing the Islamic law with the current laws. But this comparison from the beginning is unfair. Because when you compare Allah's law to man-made's law, it is as if you're comparing the creator to the creation. Allah's law comes from Allah. These laws are coming from humans. Now we said the Islamic law came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over 1400 years ago. What about the customary law? The man-made law? How it developed? How it came to us now in the constitution, in these codes and statutes that we have? It did not happen at once. Law usually starts with very limited sections and rules. And once the society grows, these laws are what? Growing. Why? Because the society needs the law to cope with the development, with its growth. The society needs law that will satisfy the needs of the society. So they make up the laws, the required laws, what is needed. If we go back, way back, we find 
some terms, some rules. In Arabia, for instance, what kind of law was prevailing before the time of the Prophet ﷺ? The tribal law. Every tribe has their own law. And the chief of the tribe is responsible for implementing the law. He is actually the law. If he says, this one is forgiven, would anyone object? No. If he says, this one would be punished, would he be exempt? He has to be punished. Keep in mind, very important point, that the current law did not come to us ready. It is the work of thousands of years, thousands of years of changing, of editing, of developing, of amending. And now we have the current law. What about the Islamic law? How many times the ayat were changed? Once the Quran, yes, there were a few changes in the Quran, but that was before, that was during the time of legislation. But once the Qur'an was perfected, was there even once a change in the Qur'an? No. So the Qur'an came to us ready. Let's look at the fundamental differences. Now, there are many, many differences, but here we're talking only about fundamental difference, differences. As we said, the ordinary law is the creation of who? The man. Are you perfect or you are imperfect as a human? You are imperfect. Do we expect from the imperfect to produce a perfect? That's why laws are changing every now and then, even in our recent time. What about the Sharia? Sharia is divine revelation. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا مبدل لكلمات الله Who knows what is better for us? If we leave matters to our own whims and desires, what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ أَمِ اللَّهِ Say, do you know better or Allah? Who knows better? So, first point, remember that Whatever the imperfect produces will be imperfect. While the Sharia is divine revelation. The ordinary law is a temporary set of codes which a society lays down. While the Sharia is a code of law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has formulated. Now, when we have a society, we want to establish laws. We make those laws suitable for us, for our current time, for our current group. And you can notice this in the individual laws. Every institute has its own set of codes because that's what fills their needs. You will not find a university implementing or forcing its laws on all other universities around the world, right? Same thing with the laws of the country. Every country has its own laws. Why is this? It is suitable for their society. While, let's look at the Sharia. Are these codes of law temporary? Are they for a small group? No. We can better understand second point in three ways. First of all, laws of Sharia are general and flexible in a way that it satisfies the needs of the communities throughout the generations. 
How was the community during the time of the Prophet Population-wise, was, was Medina overcrowded? No, it was not. How were people living? Did they have electricity? No. Did they have cars? No. What about our time now? Isn't there huge changes? There are. Did the law change? It is not. It is the same. What does that tell you? It is flexible. When it, it was suitable for them more than 1400 years ago. And now it is the same law. And it fits our needs. Isn't that flexible law? People during the time of the Prophet ﷺ were from which ethnicity? Mostly they were what? Arab. Now, do we come and say only the Arab can implement the law that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ? No. Why? It is to everyone. So this is one point that you have to keep in mind. While, let's go back 200 years ago, here in America. What kind of law was here? How many changes happened 200 years ago and now? The next point. Laws of Sharia are sublime. They are lofty. They are above the society. Did it ever happen that Muslims came together to decide that these laws have to be changed? They cannot continue anymore with these laws? It never happened, but several times it happened with the current law. The Sharia is always ahead of people. Always. You will always have answers for your questions, for your cases. Another similar thing. Who established the law? The current law. In our, in our, in America. The people, the community. The community was established and they produced the law. And they made the law suitable for their needs. So who's responsible for that law? The people. What people? The current people. Now again, 50 years from now, let's not talk about the past, let's talk about the future. 50 years from now, would laws be the same or they will be changed? Change. Change everything. They change every day, right? How many bills are submitted to the Congress, to the Senate? How many? Why? Why? Because the society is what? Is growing and faster and faster. So we need these laws. What about Islam? How many laws have changed? What does that tell you? Now, the current law is always behind. The society grows. They need a law that is contemporary to their issues, that solves their issues. While Islamic Sharia is always ahead of people. So actually, the society establishes the man-made law, but the Sharia establishes the people. See how different it is between the Sharia and the man-made law? What brought you here? And brought me next to you. You come from total different ethnicity. And different background. Islam. Islam is forming the society. Unlike the current law. Which is formed by the society. We are here together gathered. Because of Islam. While people 
gather and produce the law. So it is 180 degrees difference. It's only now, almost 150 years, that the law is almost current, almost, with the society, while it was always behind. Society grows, they say this cannot continue, we have to change, and they decide to change. And then they change. Then now they, they started planning for 20, 30 years from now. Yet it is still changing. Laws, this is the third main or fundamental difference. Laws are intended for the regulation of the affairs of the society and cannot lead the society nor formulate it, while Sharia is responsible for producing a society. When an army plans to invade, they will go by what rules? Their laws. Their laws. Which laws? When they were established a few years ago, a few decades ago, based on some wars. So the man or men came and said, these are the, law, the law, uh, laws that we will do. While the Muslim army, when it is established, laws are waiting for him to implement. Everything is ready. Do you see the difference? These are fundamental differences. Now, what makes the Islamic law different from other current laws? We have three main things. First thing, perfection. And what do we mean by perfection? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that in the Quran. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today, I completed your religion. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا It is perfect. We don't need anything. How it is perfect? We have Islamic laws for our ibadah for our transactions, for our sleeping, for our eating, even for mating, everything, it is perfect. This is something you will not find in any other law. Sublimity. Where did this law come from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> but not only that, whenever the law comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the intent of the implementation of these laws are what? What is the intention of these laws? When you implement them, you will be happy. The society will be productive. And on the Day of Judgment, what you will have? You will have the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While what is the purpose of implementing the current laws? To keep you from the crime. To make everybody safe. That's the maximum. Imagine if you implemented the current law for your entire life. Then what? What you will get? You may be poor. In the lowest rank of the society. Actually you may get killed. There is a huge difference between the current law and Allah's law. It is divine. That's why it is above other laws. The next great quality is the permanence. Since we said it is perfect, it is complete, there is nothing needed to be added to it, we say, it is always implemented. It was implemented in the past, we implement it now, and it, it is valid to be implemented forever.
These are the basic qualities. Now, let's take some issues before we move to the details. One of the issues that we find it clear in Islam is the equality. What kind of equality? Humans are equal. Don't think that this is something that people agree on or want to happen. Every time, every now and then, even in our society where we pride that we are free, we are equal, there is almost discrimination in every aspect of our affairs. And remember, we are saying this, which was already said 1400 years ago, when the society was established on the differences, that the head of the tribe, he is the law. And then there are slaves, and then in the middle there are noble people, there are people who are given protection, and there are rich people, and so on and so forth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O mankind, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Now what does that mean? Many times we see issues of discrimination. African Americans complaining that white people are, are saying bad words about them. Derogatory words. Movies some people want to picture Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, as a black man. Why? Because their race is black. While in Islam, more than 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that these are irrelevant things. You are equal. Establishing the equality is very important. And in Islam, we are equal. Until this very day, in some practices, some religions. If you follow that religion, no matter how much you are dedicated, you are in a certain level. You cannot move. And you cannot be elevated. They have five or six levels. But in Islam, we are all equal. The Prophet ﷺ said, Anasu sawasiya al People are equal, like the teeth of a calm. Have you seen a calm? They are equal. Because if one of them is higher, it will hurt your skull. It will hurt your head. But they are equal. The same thing. We are equal. If there is a difference, that difference is about righteousness. And this is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you kill a man, you deserve killing. Whether you are rich and he's poor, or he's poor and you are rich. Whether you are black and he's white, or he's black and you're white. It doesn't matter. We are equal. This is something that until this very day is not happening. Because here in the law, they force you to act equally. But whenever you know there are no consequences, you will not act equally. There is no law. While in Islam, from the beginning, it is established. So you don't need any enforcement. You have it. That's why we, we don't have the problems that this society has. Even though the law is great about giving people their freedom you can become the head of the state even if you are black but there are many many types of discrimination that we don't have them in Islam now equality between man and woman are men and women equal are they equal or they are not hmm Okay. 
This question, if you answer it as it is, no matter how you, uh, how you answer it, it is wrong. You have to ask, equal in what aspect? Because if you say we are equal 100%, that is wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُكَ الْأُنثَى But in our duties and responsibilities, we are what? I have to pray five times a day, and you have to pray how many times a day? Is it because you are female, you don't pray? No, you have to pray. But there are differences. And based on these differences, we have sometimes different responsibilities. Our rights, our duties are the same. Can a male be better than a female? Yes. Can a female be better than a male? Yes. And when there are differences, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always emphasizes that there is a reason for that preference. وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And they have the same as they owe. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلْرِّجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةً Men has a higher degree. Why they have a higher degree? Based on the responsibility. Actually, it doesn't make sense at all. If you say all men and women are equal in everything, it doesn't make sense at all. You don't accept it in a school to say all teachers are equal. There is no principle. You don't accept it in the very simple place of work where you have only five people and you say all of them are equal. Who will run the place? Same thing. Yes, there are some differences, but who acknowledges these differences? Who knows better how to treat these differences? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, we're talking about a sharia that was more than 1400 years ago. That until now, there are things that women are facing discrimination because of them, while we don't have them in Islam. Some women, they do the same job like men, and they don't get paid the same like men, while we don't have this in Islam. Many, many things. What about liberty? People always say Islam does not grant freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of belief. We tell them actually Islam indeed grants freedom. First of all, freedom of thought. Are you free to think whatever you want? Of course. Of course you are free. Actually, that's what the Sharia encourages us to do. This is what is what people don't understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran always encouraged people to do what? To think. To think. What was the problem of the disbelievers? They refused to use their sound judgment. What did they use? Their culture, their parents, their forefathers, the norm of the society. That's what they used. They refused to use common sense while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us to think to reflect to look around us how would this sharia that encourages us to think prevent us from the freedom of thought this freedom has limits that's true but this is in every law and the limits of Islam are way less than the limits in any other society. Sometimes, here in this country, the land of the free, you would be prosecuted and maybe you would be accused of treason because of the thoughts of the community, community state. Or the opposite to the United States. Just because we have these thoughts. Communism. It is prohibited. Communists were prosecuted. Why? There is no freedom of thought. Islam tells you you are free. But this freedom has to be protected also. 
That's what Islam tells us. Same thing with freedom of belief. Islam grants freedom of belief. First, it forces people to respect other people's beliefs. Second, it obliges people who have the belief to practice their belief. If you are unable to practice your belief, you are forced. You have no choice. You should leave the place where you are residing. Why? Because you cannot practice your freedom of religion. That's how much Islam is great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah An-Nisa, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ قَالُوا فِيمَا كُنْتُمْ Those whom the angels would take their souls while they wronged themselves, those people wronged themselves, would be asked, where were you? Why you are here? Why you died here? They would say, we were weak, we were helpless, we had no choice. So they would be told, wasn't the land of Allah spacious? That you would migrate? So you are to leave if you cannot practice the freedom of religion. How would then you expect from a religion like that to prevent others from practicing their beliefs? Freedom of speech, again. So we have freedom of thought. You think, but you don't exp express it. You have freedom of belief, and then you have freedom of speech to say whatever you want. We have in Islam things that they never existed in any other society. Like what? The best ibadah that you could do is to tell the truth. What's better than this freedom of speech? That you are free to say the truth. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ أَعْظَمَ الْجِهَادِ كَلِمَةُ حَقٍ عِنْدَ سُلْطَانٍ جَائِرٍ That's the greatest jihad. But again, it is not free without limits. There are limits. But here is what is amazing. These limits, when they were put, at the first place, they were put limiting the Prophet ﷺ himself. The Prophet ﷺ was the first one to be limited in the freedom of speech. How? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينِ if he would say things on our behalf that are not true, what will happen? He will die. So the Prophet ﷺ was the first one to be limited to this freedom of speech. Can you imagine how great is Islam? Being free does not mean you abuse others. You disturb others. You hurt others. And that's what people in our time don't understand. They say Islam limits the freedom of speech. No. It, it, it does limit the freedom of speech. But for the welfare of the entire humanity. Just because you like to say it without thinking of the consequences does not mean you, you should say it or you are allowed to say it. That's exactly what Islam does. One of the greatest things about Islam, the concept of shura, consultation. That's what Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, Ayah 159. And in Surah Shura, an entire Surah called Surah Shura, Their matter is 
a consultation amongst themselves. The concept of shura in Islam is very different than all other man-made laws. When we make shura, when we decide and we agree on a matter, Islam commands the minority, those who were not in favor of that decision, to implement that decision first. Can you imagine that? When we have two, two groups, majority and minority, the majority voted, and that's why they became majority. The minority voted against it. Islam tells us that this minority has to implement what the majority agreed on before the majority. An example. The Prophet ﷺ one time was with the minority. He was with the minority in the battle of Uhud. He consulted the companions. What to do? And they said, let's stay. These are the elders, those who are wise. They said, let's stay and we will wait until they come and we will kill them all. The youth were excited and they said, let's go. We want to go. Who was more? The youth. The Prophet ﷺ was in favor of which group? With the elders. Yet he himself entered and he put on his gear, his war gear, and he left. That's the concept of shura in Islam. That's what we don't have and we will never have in man-made law. Democracy that we have nowadays, which they call democracy, it is actually a deformation of the shura. The shura is the pure example of consultation. Why would the Prophet ﷺ ask companions? He's better than them. But it is the obligation of the ruler to consult. What did the people now reach? What's the maximum they got? in the declaration of freedom, in, in the dem democracy, what did they get? What they are trying to get, which they did not get yet, is what Islam already gave us, more than 1400 years ago. We're talking about light years between Islam and current laws. The world especially nowadays, is suffering from two types of ruling. Either dictatorship or democracy. So-called democracy. Dictatorship is based on what? It is based on the trust from the subject to the ruler and obedience. That's why the ruler judges. He has the power the subject trusts him, they obey him, so he does, and he commands, and he prohibits. But it developed until it became blind following, until the rulers became what? Tyrant. That's the dictatorship. We don't have this in Islam. We have obedience to the ruler, but in, with limits. With limits. What about democracy on the other hand? Shouldn't democracy be the good solution? Democracy is based on consultation. But later it became in essence democracy is consultation. But later on it is extorted. How? Whenever a decision is made, would the minority agree to it? No. What they will do? They will fight and they will have people and they will lobby until they do what? Overrule. Then what will happen? Another group will come. Another thing. Consultation 
in principle means that the ruler asks. But in democracy, sometimes now, we find that the ruler became the subject and the subject became the ruler. The ruler is unable to take any decision. Sometimes that's what's happening. So what is the pure example? It is the consultation. It is Islam. And now most democracies, they are moving towards dictatorship. How many laws are broken by the president? How many times he acquitted people they deserved to serve time in prison? How many people were killed in Iraq, American soldiers, based on lies, fake information, yet he's doing whatever he wants, the government is doing whatever it wants. Why? They are moving backwards to the dictatorship. What is the pure solution? It is Islam. Very beautiful thing about the Islamic law, which is limiting the ruler's authority. Is the authority of the ruler absolute or it is limited? Hmm? Is it limited? Shouldn't we obey Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Hmm? What about the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Wasn't he the ruler of the Muslims? Don't we obey him blindly? He's the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but as a ruler. Does he have limits to his authority? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says when the believing women give you pledge that they should obey you not in a disobedience to Allah. Allah himself is telling the Prophet sallam, that if you command them which will never happen but if, just if it happened that you command them in something against the religion would they obey or no? No. But again he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The three principles that existed in Islam, you will never find them in anywhere else. Putting limits for the ruler's authority. There are limits. We all remember the incident where the Prophet ﷺ assigned an Amir, leader, for a group. And they went and he told them to obey him. And he told them to burn themselves. He's the leader. Now we have blind following. Obey the command and then you can object. Especially in the martial laws, in the army. Can you object? No. Why? In Islam you always can. Another beautiful thing, the responsibility of the ruler for his mistakes. Just because he's a ruler, if he committed a mistake, that does not mean it will become corrected. Automatically it becomes correct just because he's a ruler. No, he has to be, he is liable. How many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected the Prophet sallallahu in the Quran? If he's an absolute ruler, he doesn't need any correction. The ruler is liable for his mistakes. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ that it was not for a messenger to take hostages, prisoners of war, to free them before many of them are killed. So he is corrected. What about the companions? The same thing. So obedience is limited. The ruler is liable. And then we have the authority of the Ummah to remove the ruler. Abu Bakr said, أَطِعُونِي مَا أَطَعْتُ اللَّهَ فِيكُمْ Obey me as long as I obeyed Allah, as long as I commanded you to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar told the companions very very beautiful example. He gave them very beautiful example. He told them, I wish if we were all in one ship, 
and the subject and the leader in that ship. He is leading them where? In the sea. Is there any margin of error in the sea? What will happen? You will drown. What if the subject refused to obey the ruler? Where would they go? Is there anywhere to go? No. He says, I wish if the subject and the ruler in a ship, as long as the ruler is straight with them, they are straight with him, as long as he deviated, they killed him. They kill him because that's the only option. Talha radiallahu heard him. He said, why don't you say as long as he deviated, they correct him. He said, because that will be a lesson for the one who is coming next. To be straight. That's the responsibility of the ruler. There is the authority of the Muslim ummah. One of the highest levels of the ibadah is to enjoy the good. And what good is better than hiring someone who will act on behalf of the Muslim ummah? And what is evil should be removed more than someone in charge of the Muslim ummah that is leading them astray? These are things that you will not find in the current law. And we will stop here inshallah and we will continue next week.